first time I heard Mark was um, Deborah. Yeah. And uh, I remember hearing it, and I never used to listen to the radio, you know, I was too busy preaching peace, you know, and painting the Beatles shop and things like that, you know, because that's what I used to do, murals for a living. Yeah. So when I met Mark, that's that's what I did. But I mean, I met Mark purely by accident. There was uh, brown rice with brown rice restaurant in um, Bishop's Bridge Road, and I went there one night with a friend, and I went. I don't know, I don't know if you've seen the picture of me uh, with the bike. Oh with the yeah. Hanging, yeah, with the bongos hanging on. Yeah, nice bike. Yeah. I I had that when I met Mark, you know. Mark used to be petrified of it. Once I could talk him to getting on. <laughs> and uh, we we used to knock about because it wasn't helmets and it was so cool, yeah. But, uh, oh, how I met Mark is quite a funny story. So I had an argument with my girlfriend who ended up being my wife. And... Uh, my friend said, oh, let's, uh, Nigel Weymouth, you know, he's a painter, he, he said, uh, come on, you, you two, get yourselves together, we'll go out. So we went to this uh, restaurant, this brown and rice restaurant, Bishop's Bridge Road, down in the basement, and it was all incense and brown rice and seaweed sort of thing. And lo and behold, I came down with my uh, girlfriend and Nigel Weymouth and his girlfriend and we came sort of as four people and we sat down at the table and we were talking or ordering and uh, Nigel said oh hello hello June hello Mark so I don't know if they came over to the table or vice versa but we ended up on the big table, and he was talking, and Nigel said to Mark, oh, how's your music going? He said, oh, lousy. He says, I've had such troubles with Steve Paragon, you know. You know, that uh, episode about the States. You know about it, do you? Well, I mean, I, I've... Well, well I've they were waiting to go to America, and the manager, who ended up uh, managing the Floyd, he used to work for NEMS and uh, he was taking Mark and June and S Steve and the logistics were very easy. It was a pair of bongos and the guitar and a packet of strings and that was it and your luggage. So anyway, Steve, funny enough the same name, he um, went round to pick up Steve, <laughs> Steve Parrott and took went round and rang the doorbell and it was like a four-storey basement and three floors above that. Couldn't get any answer. Rang and rang, threw stones, stones at the window and everything. So this guy next door said, oh, I've got this ladder, you know, three-tier ladder. You can borrow that if you want. So they got in the ladder and he climbed up and he could see See, Steve Farragon took laying it curled up. And this is the morning they're flying off in a couple of hours. And he was sick and he couldn't wake him up, so they eventually got the window open, came in and bought him round, you know, throwing buckets of water over him. And then at the very last minute they got him together and he just picked up a toothbrush. Uh, threw it in a plastic carrier bag and his passport and his bongos and that was it, off he went. And when he went to the States, uh, they were going out as a little folk duo, like jazz clubs and that, all over the States. Until one night they went out to see uh, some jazz guy, something like Stan Getz or something. And uh, it was June. Mark and Steve, and we've gone out 
and then watching. They got tickets with the same company, yeah, Warner Brothers. They have somebody on the same label, so they got two good tickets. And then I was going in, and Steve Parenton was out of his box. And all of a sudden, it was like a real classic jazz, you know, real people with jazz snobs with that. <laughs> anyway, he's been there for about half an hour or so. Apparently, he got up, pulled out his bongos out of his plastic bag, threw his toothbrush back in the back, went out, up the side of the stage and started drumming with him. And he was a real, cl and then, you know, I think it was Stan Getz or something, but a real classic jazz musician. And he had all this uh, incredible musicians, you know, renowned for their such and stuff. And they're looking at him and thinking, oh my God. So security came off and started fighting him. And, and, yeah, and the uh, auditorium in Philadelphia was like, held about 2,000 people in there. Uh, and the security came in there dragging him off and he's still saying, come on man, it's cool, and shaking, you know. And after Mark and June died of death, they thought, oh, Farron. Oh, okay. Mick Farron would have been so proud of Steve. Yeah, oh, wouldn't he? <laughs> right up his anyway. <laughs> the establishment, you know. Uh, yeah, but but as far as I, I understand it, I mean, Steve had been sacked from the tour, or sacked from the band, but was contractually obliged to go on the on the tour. Oh, what, the T-Rex? Yeah. The Translide Rex. Because, I mean, you came in after that. Yeah, I know. came in and Mark was, um, he wanted to throw in the towel, he just had it, you know. The top was up to here. And he just couldn't handle it. And uh, oh, previous to that, I'd done some stuff um, uh, with Mike back. Mike Bat, yeah. Um, uh, called. Um, oh, okay. It's gone right out of my head. Uh, I post in the colour coat, yeah. featuring the heavy metal kids, by the human host and all that, which is a mixture and everything, which came out in Liberty, and we did two albums. One was a free-for-all, and the next one was a bit more of a nice song In fact, Nigel wrote some of the words, and we did a single with um, Brian Jones produced with this uh, woman, come guy, a guy come woman, uh, Amanda Lear. She sang on it and she had deep voice, she sounded like Nico from around and around. And the, the backing track was really weird, you know. And uh, Jones got in on the act and you know, came in and played. And he was. Uh, down in the bass drum, you know, banging this thing with the carpet and then in the bank room. And uh, he said, okay, let the track roll, and it rolled. And we waited and waited and waited. About 10 minutes later, we said, we think we got it. Push the button, said, let go down it. No response. And it was Brian crashed out in the bass drum, asleep, you know, with him. Taking so many down as he was sleeping, <laughs> and we're all sitting in the control room like this, you know. So, uh, not much happened to that. That's probably not going to be somewhere. But that's um, Nigel, and that's how Nigel sort of introduced me. He said, Oh, yeah, um, I work with Mickey, he plays percussion and sings a bit, you know. And that's how I met Mark. And Mark was told me, he said, well, would you be interested? I said, oh, I don't know. I don't get old, it's early 20s. And just went with the flow, man. So I just... Yeah. Next morning, Mark, uh, I lived at uh, Marble Arts, just at Marble Arts, Stanhope Place. Mark turned up right on time, 10 o'clock, 
Yeah, with a long cloak and his ballet shoes and everything. Good in here. And his guitar. When I looked out, I thought I forgot all about it. And then he came up and he was uh, obsessed with drinking coffee, yeah? So I was making coffee and, and we just started talking about what we were like and then we started. I had some light percussion, bongos, and he was playing and we started jamming and it came out really good. And after, um, we got to say, well, after two or three days, he said, oh, well, do you plan to go into Wales and put an album together? Yeah, I said, uh, yeah, why not? So we did. And we stayed at this guy, um, probably may have heard of the company. He was the uh, young son of Wilkinson's Blades. Yeah. Uh, and he had a place and he played a little bit of acoustic. acoustic acoustic guitar and uh, so uh, also I had done uh, some soundtracks with him for an Australian film company and uh, anyway he gave us the keys to play so we, we knew each other through different directions and we went up to a place it was called Plas and we stayed there for two or three weeks and um, and that's how Beard of Stars and the act came together and Deborah and the Wizard and so forth, so forth, so on. Well, of course, I mean, a few of the tracks have been recorded before the US tour. Yeah. So, so... Yeah, uh, I mean, Deborah was up and running then. You know... No, no, I meant, I meant some of the tracks off, um, off Beard of Stars like have, have been recorded. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's on source, yeah. Yeah, but I think there's four tracks which are listed as as having been um, worked on with Steve Took and um, Mark instructed. Tony Tony Visconti said that Mark, um, you know, wanted all vestige of, of Steve removed from that those tracks. Like Mark. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then well, of course, uh, you know, they were re-recorded. Yeah, and. Unless uh, I know their tracks, then 